Welcome to the slideshow on the atom. We're going to put the atom together in this particular unit, mostly looking at section 3.5 in your textbook. <coughs> Excuse me. So it wouldn't hurt if you took got a chance to take a look at that and see what it, what's in, involved in that. Uh, we're going to do in this unit, talking about the atom indication of the atom, the atomic nucleus and all, is we're going to look at uh, the three subatomic particles that we've seen already right up here. We've seen those. Look at how those are arranged in, a, in an atom. And then look at some definitions we run into in the course of chemistry, things called atomic number, mass number, and isotopes. Uh, so we'll see those things coming up in this unit. At this point, we've got three basic subatomic particles. All were known pretty well around the 1900s, although actually the neutron wasn't discovered until 1932. It just knew, we just knew it had to be there, because without it, we we're missing a lot of mass in the atom. And so <coughs> the three particles we're looking at here are the proton, the neutron, and the electron. The symbols for them are given in, in this column. The protons are P with a plus, neutrons just an N, the electrons an E. It has a little minus up on the top uh, as a superscript. The mass I've put in here is what we call, might call relative mass, all relative to the protons, neutrons basically is what it amounts to. And what you see is that the proton and the neutron, those top two, have masses that are big or about equal to each other. We just call them one. And if you go to real atomic level scales, they're much, much smaller than that. <coughs> but for purposes of what we need to do, it's, it's help <coughs> just keep them the same size. Didn't think of them being the same size. If we call those both one, then down here what we find out is the electrons one about one two thousandth of the mass of the proton or of the neutron. So certainly <coughs> all of the uh, mass, virtually all the mass in the atom, comes from two things, the protons and the neutrons. From a charge standpoint, electrical charge standpoint, the proton is a plus one, neutron is a zero, and the electron is a minus one. So the proton and the neutron have the same charge, just opposite signs, and there is no charge in the neutron itself, which why, is why it took a while to be able to find it. Uh, and now we're going to talk about is how these things are put together. So what we'll find out in this section is that the protons, actually we found this out a little bit back in Rutherford's experiment, is the protons are in the nucleus, and it turns out the neutrons are going to be in something called the nucleus as well, and the electrons are somehow arranged outside of that nucleus. So let's take sort of a simplistic view of the atom. Think of it like what I have in this drawing inside of here. So the blue ball here, the blue sphere that I've drawn, circle that I've drawn in here, is the nucleus itself. And out here, the green things are the electrons. And inside of the nucleus, we have the protons and the neutrons. And so it's fairly simplistic. Now, the electrons really aren't out here like a little planet structure. They don't look like Earth and Mar Mercury and Mars and all that in relation to the sun. Very, very different than that. But it doesn't hurt to think of it like this <coughs> for right now. Now, Let's go and talk about some terms that we're going to run into here. It turns out that the number of protons that I have in a nucleus is actually going to identify the element for me. If I know how many protons I have in the nucleus, I can mess around with neutrons, I can mess around with electrons. But if I know how many protons I have in the nucleus, I know exactly which element it's going to be. We'll be able to see that when we look at a periodic chart. I'll pull one up in just a second. <coughs> second thing to notice on here is that if I take a look at the sum, now the protons and the neutrons are the ones that give me most of the mass in the atom. So if I take a look at the sum of those two, that's pretty much the mass of the atom. And so we have a special name for that. It's called the mass number. Okay, the mass number is right here. And we give a symbol A. Now the thing about the mass number is it's not really a mass. It's an integer. It's going to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15. That's what it's going to be. It doesn't really tell me the mass. It kind of gives me an idea in atomic units what the mass is going to be. You will not find that number on the periodic chart. It's not going to be there at all. And the other thing we'll find out is that the number of electrons you have in an atom will equal the number of protons in it if the atom has no electrical charge. The way we'll get electrical charges on atoms is to take and add and subtract electrons from them. So once I know the protons, the electrons match if it's a neutral atom. If it has a charge, then that means they either have an excess of electrons or have a shortage of electrons. <coughs> Excuse me. In the, in the one I have here, if I count him up, he's got one, two, three, four, five. This would be an atom of boron. Let's take a look at a periodic table for just a minute. If I can figure out where I put it. There it is. Oh, nope, that wasn't it. 
right there. And so if you look at this in the periodic table, the integer up at the top, right up in, oh, I can't do that. The integer up at the top here is 5, right above boron. tells me boron has 5 five protons in its nucleus. If I look at an element like arsenic, it has 33 above it, that means there are 33 Ar uh, 33 protons in a nucleus of arsenic. It I absolutely and totally and always identifies the element. The number of protons tells me that. Number of neutrons, not necessarily. Number of electrons, not necessarily. But the number of protons tells me which element it is. By the way, this periodic table you're looking at is one that you'll get on tests, on the proctored tests and exams. I'll give you a copy of this. Notice it has the names with it, so you don't have to memorize all the names. There's no point in, in having you do that. So let's take a look then back here and take a look at <coughs> <coughs> what happens when I have atoms of the same element that differ in their number of neutrons. We can have a term for that. It's called isotopes. So two atoms of the same element that have differing number of neutrons are called isotopes. And so, for example, if I go back and think about... Uh, think about boron, and boron has five protons, and as long as I have five protons, it's boron. But I might have five neutrons, or I might have six neutrons, or I might have seven neutrons in it. That is an isotope. Those are isotopes of each other inside there. Some examples I give you down here. Carbon has some fairly famous isotope examples. Carbon always has six protons because he's atomic number six. So I'll know it's, it's carbon. But then it turns out he can have six, or seven, or eight uh, neutrons in his nucleus, which means his mass number, the sum of those two, can be 12 or 13 or 14. You may have heard of carbon-14, carbon-14 dating. It's a way we look at radioactive isotopes toward the end of the semester. We'll see a little bit of that. And can figure out something about how old something is based on the radioactive life in it. Chlorine exists in a couple different isotopes. Uh, has 35 and 37 <coughs> so it's always got 17 protons but it could have 18 or it could have 20 neutrons and hydrogen exists as isotopes also always have one proton we can have zero one or two neutrons inside of it the most famous one there probably the one with zero neutrons is the hydrogen are used to in our water and all. But if you ever heard of heavy water related to nuclear types of plants and things like that, that's one that has a neutron and a proton. That's what we call heavy water. You can't look at the periodic table and get any information at all about the abundance of these isotopes or anything of that nature. All you get from the periodic table is here's the atomic number. So we need to come up with terminology instead of drawing those circles and all because we aren't always good at drawing the circles and dots as I am. And so we had to figure out a way of doing this. And so the way we typically do it is we'll take and write the chemical symbol here. The chemical symbol, symbol is a one or two letter or maybe three letter abbreviation off the periodic table. The mass number goes on top and the atomic number goes as a, as a suffix of a um, subscript out in front of the chemical symbol. So it looks something like this in symbol forms. If you look at the isotopes I mentioned on the previous slide, this is what carbon-12 would look like. It's got six protons has 12 protons plus neutrons. That's the mass number on top. So altogether, this guy has 12 minus 6 is he has 6 neutrons. Since this is the sum, all I have to do is subtract the atomic number, and that's how many neutrons I've got inside of there. And so there's the isotopes we talked about in the previous slide. Uh, not much to know about that other than the fact the proton number has to match the symbol. If, if this is a 6, this is a carbon. If this is a B for boron, this is a 5 down here. They always have to match. You can't have it, but I can have different numbers up on top in there. So when we think about things getting together, forming compounds and things like that, what we really look at is those electrons out there are going to be the busy ones. The electrons can be picked up. They can be given up. Uh, and when they do so, they're going to affect the things we can make, the compounds we can make, the things that, can <coughs> that we can create. So the thing to think about in here, and we'll, I'll pull up a simulation in just a minute, is the protons are positive, the electrons are negative. If I have, let's say, five protons and five electrons to start with, if I take away an electron, I'll have five protons and four electrons, which means I have an extra positive charge, don't I? So I have a plus one charge on that. If I remove those electrons, because they're negative, if I remove those electrons, the charge on my species becomes positive. 
if I add electrons to an atom, then I'm going to have species, now it's going to have a negative charge because it has extra electrons. This thing we form, and when we do this, is whenever we take and move the electrons, take them or add them onto some, some particular atom, we form something called an ion. You've probably heard of ions. You've heard about electrolytes that comes in and kind of gets related to ions down the road here. And think, keep in mind, since an electron is negative, if I have a loss of electrons, it'll lead to a positive ion referred to as a cation. So losing electrons, because they're negative, makes it positive, and it's called a cation. Uh, if I take and look at gaining electrons, if I gain electrons in an atom, then I have more charges, it's going to be negative, and what I end up with is a new ion has a negative charge to it, it might seem natural to call this a dog ion, since that was a cation up there, but instead we call it an anion. So an anion has negative charge. What we do to indicate the charge is we put a superscript up to the right of the symbol to let us know what the charge is on it. So let's take a look at an example over here. Uh, a lot of words on these slides, but chlorine has 17. This particular isotope has 17 protons. Actually, it doesn't matter about the isotope here. We're only talking about protons and electrons. The isotopes are only different neutrons. So I have 17 protons, 17 electrons, that would be a neutral atom. But now if my chlorine gains an electron, it'll have an extra electron, that'll mean it has a 1 minus charge. And so if my mass number is 35, uh, the symbol for that element would be chlorine right here. 17 is the atomic number, 35 is the mass number because we gave it to you here in the problem. And this little guy right here, this negative sign, tells me it has a negative one charge. That tells somebody that knows something about it that, hey, I've got an extra electron. Uh, so this is an example of an anion because it's a negative ion. If I turn around and look at a barium atom over in, uh, in the periodic table, let's look at where chlorine is <coughs> for just a minute to get an idea. Chlorine is right up in here, upper right, number 17. Notice I had him picking up one electron, which means he would have the same number of electrons as argon has, if he were to do that. If I look at the, my next example, it's barium, all the way down here, number 56. If he loses two electrons, he'll have the same number of electrons as xenon. That's going to be important for us later on. So let's go back here and take a look at my... So, now, well, okay, so I, sorry, my camera's messing up. We're going to look at a simulation, <coughs> well, these FET simulations, see if we get an idea about building the atoms and how this thing all goes together. So let me go switch over to that. Here. Okay, this is a simulation that, you can, again, you can pull up and play with it. I have the, the address, the web address here in the PowerPoint. I also have it in the link out in Blackboard, but it's called uh, Build an Atom. And so what you look here is you have a couple buckets of protons, neutrons, and electrons down at the bottom. And what I can do is take and just start throwing some protons up here into the nucleus, because that's where they go. Notice when I throw one proton in, I've got hydrogen right there. If I throw in two, oops, I missed, not a very good thrower. Throw in two of those, now I've got helium, got two over there. If I go and throw another one in, now I'm up to three as a lithium. I'm just going up by atomic number. As I add each proton, I change which element I've got. Now, if I add the neutron, so here I'm sitting at lithium. If I th go and throw a neutron in there, notice I still have lithium, still have lithium, still have lithium. And notice it tells me if it's stable or unstable. That's stable. This guy over here, he's stable. So those are isotopes of each other. Put that the other one in. It's going to be an isotope. It's probably unstable. That one's going to be unstable. I don't know if I can take one out or not. No, I can take it out. It's like that. So there's a sta stable lithium atom. Now, if I look at that lithium, think about what we have in there. We've got a total of three protons, four neutrons. What's its mass number? No, you didn't say that right. It's seven. Seven is his mass number. Three plus four is going to be seven. Put some electrons in this lithium. Now, I'm going to throw a couple of electrons up in here. <laughs> what I end up with is a couple of electrons inside of here. Now think about what this guy is. Since I have three protons and I have two electrons, they don't match. It means he's going to have a charge. Since I'm missing an electron, he's going to be positively charged. And as a matter of fact, with three pluses and two minuses, I end up with a plus one charge. So you see the plus one over here. For that, if I take a look at the symbol 
for it's going to show it to me here there's a lithium it has three protons right there it has seven for mass number that's protons plus neutrons so that's my three plus my four is going to be seven and then my charge is since I have three pluses and two minuses is a plus one charge so that's my symbol for it the mass number what is it yep it's seven the net charge on it is okay it's gonna be plus one notice they've got Bracket this out so I have two pluses, two minuses, they cancel out, but there's that extra positive sitting around over here. And there's a game here if you're kind of the competitive type, you can actually go into this and oh, I should have just. <coughs> I was playing with it earlier, but you can set the game level and all that kind of stuff. Um, go over right here and it says find the element. So let's see here. So if I'm going to go in here, one, two, three, I have three. Were those protons? I can't remember. If there are three protons, it might be that we've got lithium. And then we look out here, two. Well, as a matter of fact, this is the one I just built. Okay, he doesn't have, he has three protons, but only has two electrons, and therefore he's going to be an ion. He's going to have a charge on him. We check him, and he liked that. Okay, so it's, it's quite a hoot. You can sit and play that for, for hours on end, uh, practicing your protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, so. I want to show you one other thing while we're at it, because sometimes these periodic table things are kind of fun if you don't, if you kind of look at it in the sense of, right here, this is one that's a pictorial one, you can pick this up on the internet, periodictable.com, shows pictures of the different elements, what I want you to notice about it as you look across here, is, <coughs> if I asked you where the metals were on here, I think you'd have a pretty easy time telling me that just from your stand from your understanding of metals over here are metals over on this side looks over here and then these guys over here on the right hand side they're starting to look not so metallic like okay and so so you actually change and what you'll find out in the periodic table is coming up fairly soon is as we come across the properties keep changing gradually changing 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 until they're completely different and we wrap around, for example, from argon over to potassium. Now, all of a sudden, my start going through my cycle again. And so the periodic table is kind of a fun thing. A lot of what we're talking about now will come into telling us why things show up where they do on the periodic table. And I believe that is the end of this PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'll see you next time.